Okay, scripture reading today will be found in 2 Kings 6, 24 and 25. Sometime later, however, King Ben-Hadad of Aram mustered his entire army and besieged Samaria. As a result, there was a great famine in the city. The siege lasted so long that a donkey's head sold for 80 pieces of silver and a cup of dove's dung sold for five pieces of silver. Just enough time to get out here to be able to preach. Thank you. <laughs> we moved that prayer time up just because I could see it wasn't going to happen in 30 seconds. Would you bow your heads with me as we seek the Lord first in prayer? Father in heaven, Lord, I pray that you would speak to our hearts as we open them up to you here this morning. And that you would use me as a vessel to bring this message today. I pray that we'll touch each heart with exactly what they need to hear. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, as you heard an unusual scripture reading for today, it gave you at least the perspective or the situation that was going on in Samaria. That Samaria had come under siege. And in fact, it didn't look like it was a very hopeful situation at all. This battle between Assyria and the northern kingdom of Israel had been going on a long time. The Assyrians had been the enemies of, um, of Israel for a long time, dating back to David's reign in around 1000 BC. Uh, this area the modern, of modern-day Syria, uh, speaking of Aram in the text here, other uh, translations use the, uh, uh, the, the, the name of Syria or Assyria. It depends upon the scripture that you're reading. Uh, that takes place, or, or that nation was situated in the northern, kind of northeastern part of where we see Syria situated today. And in fact, it is right in the town of Aleppo. If we go forward one uh, scripture, where are you, Rochelle? Oh, okay, it won't go. <laughs> okay, I have some, some slides to go along with this. There was the scripture. Let's go past the scripture to the map, and you'll be able to see where this was all taking place. Okay, do you see that? The kingdom of Aram, Damascus? All right, in the Middle East. That's where this was taking place. Uh, in fact, Aleppo is right where this siege took place. How many are familiar with Aleppo? It's been in the news over the last how many years. It's kind of slowed as far as the coverage of it here recently, but it was a war that took place within Syria, kind of a civil war, so to speak, and really demolished most of the city from about 2012 to 2016, a very sad situation indeed. But the story we're looking at here takes place in the ninth century, about a hundred years before the kingdom of the kingdom of northern kingdom of Israel was finally defeated and conquered by its enemies. In fact, the situation was so desperate that we find this story in our uh, in the scriptures today. If you'd like to follow along with me, I'm in Second Kings chapter six but the scripture will also be up on the screen. It says that one day as the king of Israel was walking along the wall of the city, a woman called to him, please help me, my lord, the king. He answered, if the Lord doesn't help you, what can I do? I have neither food from the threshing floor nor wine from the press to give you. But the king asked, what is the matter? She replied, this woman said to me, come on, let's eat your son today. Then we will eat my son tomorrow. So we cooked my son and we ate him. Then the next day I said to her, kill your son so we can eat him. But she has hidden her son. Now, we have all been in some desperate situations. But I will venture to say, none as desperate 
as this. In fact, it's a little bit beyond our comprehension, isn't it? Mothers out there, beyond your comprehension. I won't just say that, well, the culture was different back then, because I don't believe any culture loves their sons less as a parent. But I will say this, this was such a desperate situation that the people were beginning to do things that they never dreamed they would do. You know, one of the challenges I think today is that we don't understand the depths to which sin will take us. Desperation will take us. But we find in this story that will take us to some extreme measures if we allow it to do just that. And especially if we lose our hold on God. You see, these events, the the siege, and then of course after years, they began to resort to cannibalism. These things were all a consequence of repeated and ongoing disobedience to God and his plan for their lives, especially that of the king, as we will see here shortly. You know, I will always say there's, there are consequences for choosing to live your life outside of God's plan for you. I was listening last night, a, a fantastic message from um, Chantel, who spoke to us at the Welcome Home Project. And, you know, she was talking about this very thing that, you know, don't let sin get in because it will take you to places you haven't dreamed. And it always seems like, as she elaborated, it always seems like, why is it that the wicked seem to live so much better than us? In fact, I think it was David, uh, the psalmist. Actually, no, it was, um, it was not David, the psalmist. It was another psalmist who raised this issue saying, God, why is it that all the wicked around us are prosperous and we, your people, are starving sometimes even for food? It seems like his eyes were now, as the psalmist, his eyes began to look where? Outside rather than looking to to God. Now, praise the Lord, we know through the rest of the Psalms that the psalmists often uh, voice their strong feelings and desires and challenges to God, and I think we should never be ashamed of doing that. But yet we should always remember that dialogue with God, even in trouble, is always the best, because you and God can always work things out. In this case, this nation, the northern kingdom, had been walking contrary to God's plan for years. And it was continuing on as if nothing bad was ever going to happen. You know, we can get very comfortable in our lives, can't we? And it can seem like, you know what? God has blessed me so much, I'm just kind of cruising right now, things are going well. And then, as many of us know, at least I've experienced in my life, something changes. And that's the enemy at work, trying to get you to turn away from the God that you love and trust. You see, God warned them 400 years before this through the words of Moses in Deuteronomy 28.53, where he pronounced, God pronounced blessings and curses upon Israel. And this was one of the curses that he said would result if they were to walk contrary to God's plan and his protection around them as a nation. Moses says the siege, and this is, of course, words from the Lord through Moses, the siege and terrible distress of the enemy's attack will be so severe that you will eat the flesh of your own sons and daughters whom the Lord your God has given you. Now, I'm sure those hearing that would say, this is never going to happen to me. And while we may never see this kind of situation in our own lives, let's never underestimate what the enemy can do if he does get a hold of us to take us where he wants us to go. God loves and protects his people, and there's no better place to live than in his will. Amen? Can you remember a time where you were desperate? Maybe even now you're in a desperate situation. Your husband or wife, your spouse, has said they don't love you anymore, at least not like they used to. A loved one is diagnosed with terminal cancer. 
a friend dear to you was killed in some accident. You know, these are all desperate situations. We're just, it's hard to deal with them, to grapple with the, the consequences of losses like that. But know this, God never leaves you nor forsakes you. If you have given yourself to him, he will see you through. It says in verse 30 of chapter 6, when the king heard this, he tore his clothes in despair. And as the king walked along the wall, the people could see that he was wearing burlap under his robe next to his skin. And then notice this, these words from the king. May God strike me and even kill me if I don't separate Elisha's head from his shoulders this very day the king vowed. You know, it can be tempting to blame someone else when you're going through troubles. (laughs) And the king thought of the one person that he thought was at least bringing these troubles upon them, and that was Elisha. But in reality, I'll tell you what, I have a friend of mine that used to say this all the time. If you can see your enemy, it's not really your enemy. You see, your enemy is unseen. He just likes to use other people to get at you. And in this case, the king was so angry, he couldn't see that his own actions had separated him from God, and God was allowing these things to come upon him to get him to turn back to the Lord. He wanted to blame someone else, and he blamed the prophet Elisha. Now, it is true that God does allow bad things to happen in this world. We have all experienced that, and we've read about some horrible things in this world. But it doesn't mean that they are his will. Do you see the difference? God doesn't will that we die. Uh, Even this whole phrase, God took him when uh, some guy dies, or, or God took her if a gal passes away from cancer. That wasn't God's will that they die. It's the enemy that is working behind the scenes constantly to take us away from God who loves us and wants to protect us. Well, it says in verse 32, as the scene shifts to Elijah in his house, Elisha was sitting there in his house with the elders of Israel when the king sent a messenger to summon him. But before the messenger arrived, Elisha said to the elders, A murderer has sent a man to cut off my head. When he arrives, shut the door and keep him out. We will soon hear his master's steps following him. While Elisha was saying this, the master arrived, and the king said, the king right behind him, the king said, All this misery is from the Lord, Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? There's almost in these words a a semblance of reason here. Because even though he's angry at Elisha, he recognizes that the Lord is allowing this terrible thing to happen to Israel. His problem is, is that he doesn't realize that the problem is him. He's got the issue. And in fact, he gets so worked up by this problem, by this this wanting to take Elisha's Elisha's life, that the person that he sent to go do it for him, it's not good enough. He rushes ahead to catch up to him so that he can take his head himself. I will say this. uh, One of the most dangerous things we can do when trouble comes, even just negative situations, circumstances happen, is to try and fix it ourselves. Uh, come on, we've, we, uh, we have to confess to this. All of us in problems mull over, how can I fix it? Right? In fact, many times, and I'll confess this myself, it's about another few hours or a day later that I realize, oh, wait a minute, I need to go to the great fixer, (laughs) who is my Lord and Savior, Jesus. Because he knows what I'm going through. He can help fix this situation. 
But I'll tell you what, sometimes it takes us a long time to figure that out, or somehow we're just not in the habit of doing it, so we struggle with going to him first. And certainly this is one of the things the king was doing. We also see that character shows up when trouble comes. You know, I, I, I'll tell you, it, it's interesting, just a little bit of an experience. You come to a new situation, even like a pastor coming into a new church. People can be on their best behavior. Now, you're looking for a new pastor, right? Scott the Thunderbird? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm sure probably when he arrives, you'll be on your best behavior. But when trouble comes, hey, forbid, when he disagrees with you, that's when the character comes out. That's when we're all tested. We're not tested by people that agree with us. We can hang out all day with people that believe exactly and think exactly like us. You see, the challenge is, how do you respond? How do you interact with people that don't think the way that you think? And so, we find these challenges to our character that come, and it certainly came to the king. And in no way was the king thinking like Elisha was thinking, because Look at the, the message that Elisha gives back to the king, his response in, in chapter 7, verse 1. Elisha replies to the king and says, listen to this message from the Lord. There's a little bit of a play, a shift here, because if you recall, the last words that the king said is that all this misery is from the Lord. And then Elisha's reply is, listen to the, this message that is coming from the Lord. And here's what he says. By this time tomorrow, in the markets of Samaria, six quarts of choice flour will cost only one piece of silver, and 12 quarts of barley grain will cost only one piece of silver. Now, right here, the king has an opportunity to accept the promise or to keep down the course that he's laid before him. Right now is when God is saying, I can handle this problem. And think about the situation. Let's not forget what we opened with. The desperate situation. They had the Assyrian army all around Samaria. There was nowhere for them to go. There was no food in Samaria. And all of a sudden, God is going to reduce the cost of even flour just to a piece of silver. Everybody, the markets will open again and it will flow. I have to be thinking, because I read in this story that the, the king is somewhat open to God's leading. The, he, he didn't take Elisha's head off right away, right? He engaged him in conversation. He waited to hear what Elisha had to say. There, there's some receptivity as to, could God possibly solve this problem? Don't ever forget your troubles are God's opportunities. Your troubles are God's opportunities. Let him work. Can you repeat that with me? Let him work. Let him work in your life the promises that he has given you, hundreds of them in here. Let God work. Craig D. Lounsborough, an author, wrote, My focus is not on the flood that surrounds me. Rather, my focus is on the God who surrounds the flood. He had the right perspective. God, what are you going to do because you own the flood? Well, as the king is contemplating the words of Elisha, notice what happens here. This officer that came with him in verse 2, it says, the officer assisting the king said to the man of God. So he's now, the king's not replying to Elisha. He's thinking about it. This officer replies to Elisha. Look what he says. That couldn't happen even if the Lord opened up the windows of heaven. 
But Elisha replied, you will see it happen with your own eyes, but you won't be able to eat any of it. My friends, this was a promise that God had given through the prophet Elisha. And while the king has been, had been mulling over it, this officer steps forward to steal away any thoughts that God can solve this problem, this, this issue. How many of you are familiar with the story of, of the woman that had sought doctors for years and years and years. She, she was, had a, a medical issue. She was bleeding a lot. And she, she waited for Jesus to walk by. And she stepped out. And she touched the hem of his garment. And she was healed. You familiar with that story? Great story. Do you realize that that story sits in the middle of another story that is intended to teach us a lesson? The other story is Jairus, who had asked Jesus to come to his house to heal his daughter, who was dying. And Jesus replied, sure, I'll go with you. And they're going together. And of course, Jairus is thinking, can we hurry this pace up a little bit? <laughs> and what happens? This inc- the, the daughter died, but in the, as the daughter's dying, this woman interrupts Jesus and stops to engage with him. And Jairus is watching this happen. And it's interesting, as he's watching this happen, the report comes from his house, Jairus, don't bother the the prophet, don't bother him. Your daughter is already dead. And in the middle of, of helping this woman, Jesus turns back to Jairus and says, don't, essentially, don't listen to him. Believe. And what's the rest of the story? Jesus goes with Jairus to his house and raises his daughter back to life. You see, the most desperate situations are God's opportunity to work. Beware of those around you that are sent by the enemy to bring doubt. Even your friends who are trying to counsel you, be careful of those who are sent to bring in doubt. Because the doubt that they try to bring in is sent by the enemy to get you to lose your faith. It says in James 1, 6, and 7, but when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver, for a person who is with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Speaking of doubt, don't doubt But I'll go a step further. Also be aware that you might be tempting someone else to doubt. Because I'll tell you, in both situations, nothing but bad can happen. As we will find with the rest of this story. Now the story shifts here. And it takes us to another scene. And it picks up here in verse 3. The very next verse, as we're reading down. Now, there were four men with leprosy sitting at the entrance of the city gates. They were talking to each other, and they said, why should we sit here waiting to die? We will starve if we stay here, but with the famine in the city, we will starve if we go back there. So we might as well go out and surrender to the Aramean army. If they let us live, so much the better. But if they kill us, well, we would have died anyway. This is pretty good reasoning, isn't it? (laughs) We would have died anyway. So, at twilight, they set out for the camp of the Arameans. But when they came to the edge of the camp, no one was there. For the Lord had caused the Aramean army to hear the clatter of speeding chariots and the galloping of horses, and the sounds of a great army approaching. The king of Israel has hired the Hittites and the Egyptians to attack us, they said. So they panicked, and they ran into the night, abandoning their tents, horses, donkeys, and everything else, and they fled for their lives. 
Now, the story goes on to tell us that these lepers, of course, are overjoyed that no one is there and all this stuff is left behind, and they start to do what? Hey, you can't blame them. Let's at least eat something here, right? But they sit down, they start eating, they start enjoying themselves, and then it struck them. You know, this is wrong. <laughs> we're eating, we're filling our own stomachs, yet all of our people back in Samaria are dying of starvation. We need to go back and tell them what we found. So they went back, it was reported to the king, and guess what? The king didn't believe it. The king didn't believe it could possibly have happened. Only after he sent someone to check it out did the news come back, yes, these lepers are right. The army's gone. You see, instead of trusting that God has indeed performed a miracle, the king had to see it for himself. Kind of like the doubting Thomas thing, right? Thomas said, unless I see him with my own eyes, I will not believe. Well, friends, I think it's time to begin to trust in the word of God fulfilled instead of playing a wait and see what happens game. Because this is dangerous. I, when I was a young kid, senior in, in academy, I didn't have a care in the world. At least I didn't think I did. And I know many of you young people haven't even gotten to that age yet. Maybe some of you are right there. Um, but I just, I don't know. I lived as if there was always going to be a tomorrow. And I had been growing up in, in a Christian home, an Adventist home, and was always told or taught that God is not only real, but he's experientially real in your life day by day as you walk with him. You can experience him and his leading and his love for you. But after uh, about this time, my senior year, I began to wander. I began to stray and do my own thing, as they say. Of course, you realize there's no such thing as my own thing. That's kind of a fallacy that us young people, at least when I was young, that I invented. We all invent that. You know, I don't really want to follow God fully. I'm not following the devil. I'm going to do my own thing. There's no own thing. You follow God, or you, if you walk away from him, you leave yourself open to the enemy. And so this car, I don't know, to tell you the truth, looking back, I don't know why my dad bought it for me. I lived in Angwin, California, and if anybody of you, how many of you have been to Angwin before? Okay. Yeah, Zach, I know PUC, we're, we have the same alma mater. That that road from St. Helena up is a racetrack. And I had my share of races going up and down that hill. But you know what? Since then, later on in life, and maybe even the time that you were there, Zach, I've heard several stories where kids died going up and down that hill very fast. I've had that car going sideways at 85 miles an hour in the other lane and no one was there. And I thought, boy, that was a close call. Didn't realize God was probably holding somebody else coming the other direction up just so I could have my little thing and he could protect me. Because my parents were on their knees praying for me. Get me a fast car and then pray for me. <laughs> but I used to sit there in that car and I'd, I kind of rationalize. You know, because God would speak. He would speak to me. And he'd say, John, you're not where I want you to be. Come back. And I'd brush it aside. I wouldn't listen. Party out with my friends. John, I miss you. No, I'm not interested right now. Somehow, I thought I always had a tomorrow. Friends, you don't always have a tomorrow. Today is the day. What does it say in 2 Corinthians 6, 2? Behold, now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of what? Salvation. Well, back to our story. The people heard the good news. Verse 16. And the people of Samaria rushed out and plundered the Aramean camp. 
So it was true that six quarts of choice flour was sold that day for one piece of silver, and 12 quarts of barley grain were sold for one piece of silver, just as the Lord had promised. That's an amazing turn of events, wouldn't you say? But you know what? That's not the end of the story. Read with me verse 17. The king appointed his officer to control the traffic at the gate. But he was knocked down and trampled to death as the people rushed out. So everything happened exactly as the man of God had predicted when the king came to his house. And what was part of that prediction? You will see it with your own eyes, but you will not get to eat any of it. You see, the fruit of doubt, the fruit of losing your hold on God, is the inability of partaking of his blessing. When the blessing comes, when God breaks through and the challenge that you're facing, he begins to solve and bring back to, to your favor. If you don't hold on, you don't get that blessing. And in fact, it often results in our worst fears happening. Uh, there are proven studies that people can actually talk themselves in their minds, talk themselves into being sick and even dying. They are so negatively focused on what can't happen that's good that they end up experiencing the reality of their worst fears. I call that worry. How about you? Is that the short word? I was listening a few weeks ago to a person on the radio, and um, they, they mentioned what worry in reality was, and I hadn't really thought of it, but they said worry is a negative form of meditation. Have you ever thought about that? I thought that was really good. Worry is a negative form of of meditation. But what does God tell us to meditate on? That which is good and pure and lovely and the uplifting and just encouraging. All that God said happened in that gate. My prayer is that we experience the blessings of God's grace. Amen? But to experience the blessings, to hold those blessings in your hand, means you got to hold on to God through the trial first. Christopher Gadsden was a Charleston board, Charleston born Brigadier General in the Continental Army during the American Revolution. He designed a flag in 1775 that depicted a timber rattlesnake. You seen this one? in a menacing position and provocative slogan written on it, don't tread on me. Okay, young people, have you seen this flag before? Okay, I didn't think so. Okay, some of you might have, but it might have come from your parents. Okay, my generation, okay, you're, you're in your 50s, your 60s, your 70s. Have you seen this flag? Yeah, okay. This had a resurgence in the 60s and 70s. And it became known as a flag that people waved and posted that depicted their opposition to um, oppression, oppressive governments and powers. And it was this, you know, don't tread on me. Let me live my life. Well, let me say this. That mantra which actually was the mantra and held by the Continental Marines for quite a few years as well. That mantra could very well be ours in a good way when it comes to Satan and his efforts to trample on us. As the man, as the officer was trampled in the gate, in reality, his enemy, Satan, trampled him, right? Our mantra can be, as we stand with Christ, don't tread on me, I believe in Jesus. 
And this flag, although it had some negative connotation uh, right around the 70s and 80s, for the most part, it has a positive understanding of making sure that we are not taken captive by some oppressive enemy force, but we live in the freedom of the United States of America, and that's where we stand. As a Christian, we will not allow Satan to take us into slavery. We will live under the banner of Jesus Christ and the freedom he offers. Hebrews 11 is the great faith chapter. You see over and over again, by faith, by faith, by faith, the matriarchs, the patriarchs of faith conquered the enemy by trusting in the power of the living God. But right on the heels of that faith chapter, we read these words from Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses, to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by what? Keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Don't let the enemy tread on you. You are a son and a daughter of the living God. You see, some temptation is all about taking your eyes off of Jesus and putting them on other things that are enticements that the enemy throws out there. He makes it look like the wicked have it all good. But in reality, it's just an enticement to get you away from God And then to do what? To tread on you. As in our story today, I want to encourage you today to put your trust, your faith in the promises of God. Let him work through the challenge no matter how desperate your situation may seem. And if it's not desperate now, hey, life is as such where it will become desperate in the future. Even as a church, we understand that there is a time of trouble coming. Our only refuge is in God, is in Christ, our champion, who's not only the author, but the finisher of our faith. I am so excited for Michael and Maya. They have declared today that Jesus is their champion. They have thrown up that flag, don't tread on me any longer, (laughs) because I cling to Jesus, and he will never leave me nor forsake me. And more than that, no matter what trial comes, I'm going to hold on to him and experience his blessing as he gets me through. I'd like to invite uh, Michael and Maya up here. I think we have a gift from the church. And so we want to give that gift at this time. Michael and Maya, I see Maya. Where's Michael? There you are. Come up here. We have a gift for you. I'm going to let you step up to the podium here and explain here what you're giving. So on behalf of the Scottsdale Thunderbird Adventist Church, we want to welcome you to our membership. Yay! (laughs) And we have just a little something from the church for both of you with your baptismal certificate in there as well. Thank you. What a great example today of a declaration of faith and trust in the Lord. And a reminder to all of us who struggle with the trials and the challenges of life as we grow older to know that God was our God from the beginning and he will be our God right through to the end if we keep our hold on Jesus. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for the blessing here today of of being able to observe baptism here of both Michael and Maya. I commit them to you and your protection, your loving care. But Lord, more than that, even as an example to us, we're reminded that we serve the living God who has answers to every problem that comes our way. I pray, Lord, that none of us will get trampled in the gate, but instead we will cling to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, 
And that once that trial gets through, as he's with us through it, that in the end we will experience the promised blessing. Lord, we await your soon return. We can't wait till you come back. But Lord, hold fast to us today as we reach our hands up to you and get us through the challenges and even give us some of the blessed experiences, a foretaste of heaven here as we get to experience within this church family and as we get to meet and share your loving gospel with those around us. Bless and keep us, I pray, and this church. In Jesus' name, amen.